Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, make us worthy to celebrate the feast of your ascension. We raise our pure hands to you in prayer, our chained souls to you filled with grace, and our sincere hearts to you with love. We yearn for that place to which you have ascended, so that with the host of angels we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children.
to our Lord, accept the fragrance of this incense that we have offered to you on the feast of your ascension into heaven. Grant that we may prepare ourselves to receive the Holy Spirit, whom you promised to send to us. May we take the places that you have prepared for us in the presence of the Father and meet you in the heavenly kingdom. We praise you, your Father, and your living Holy Spirit forever. Put all things beneath his feet 
and gave him as a head over things to all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of one who fills all things in every way. Praise be to God always. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. We remain silent and listen to the Holy Gospel. It's about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. When Judas had left, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and he shall glorify him at once. My children, I shall not be with you. I shall be with you only a little while longer. You shall look for me, and as I have told the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. And so now I say it to you. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so also you should love one another. This is how all shall know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the truth, peace be with you. <clears throat> Praise and blessing to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for giving us His words of light. Praise and blessing to Jesus Christ, our Lord. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, and that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <coughs> Saint Isaac of Nineveh in his writings, talks about the three forms of knowledge which are possible to human beings. Isaac of Nineveh, yes. There were some noses scrunched up. Isaac of Nineveh lived in the 700s. He was born in the area which is now known as Qatar. And yes, our saints come from really the Middle East, not just Eastern Europe, but really from what is the large sense of Arabia. So St. Isaac of Nineveh was a monk for his life, 
And for a very short period, he was Bishop of Nineveh. Qatar is way in the south, Nineveh is up in the north. Nineveh is what you watch on CNN when all the wars break out around Mosul. Mosul is the area of ancient Nineveh. And so he was only bishop though for six months and he quit the job because it was too much and he went back to being a hermit. So see, he chose the better part. But in his writings, and he's prolific in his writings, in his writings, Isaac talks about three forms of knowledge. The first form of knowledge we're all very much acquainted with, which is by senses. We see things, we touch, our knowledge comes in. We, we considered and reflected upon this for the Feast of the Ascension. The second knowledge is the perception of the intellect to be able to see and to perceive not just colors and the sounds that we hear, but to know things as they are. It's one thing to see a green object and talk about leaves and a tree. It's another thing to actually know a tree as a tree. And we've talked about this in the religion class on Wednesdays. For your dog, the fire hydrant is just a place to mark his territory. But we can know fire hydrant as fire hydrant. We can know it's made out of, out of metal. We can know that it's hooked up to a water system. We can know all the engineering behind it. Your dog will never know that. So we can know things as they are in themselves. But St. Isaac also mentions that there is a third form of knowledge for the Christians. And he says it's the knowledge of revelation. I bring it up because of what St. Paul says in this epistle that you have in the bulletin today. He prays for the Ephesians that they may, and oh, by the way, you notice in the first line when he says, I've heard about your faith. It's very likely that St. Paul had actually never met the people at Ephesus, but he's heard about them and what a fantastic parish they are. So when he writes to them, he says, I've heard about your faith and how you live this reality. But then he says, so I pray with great thanksgiving for you because you are an honor to the body of Christ because of the way you live, because of the faith that you have perceived. And I ask that you go deeper and deeper into it and that you may receive the spirit of wisdom. And we've considered that before. Wisdom is the aspect of being able to see with the eyes of God from God's perspective, from the aspect of eternity, judge everything but also the spirit of revelation. And what St. Isaac of Nineveh means by the spirit of revelation also, certainly being influenced by the writings of St. Paul in this letter to the Ephesians, the word revelation just means unveiling. So the spirit of revelation is the perception of the human spirit, the human mind, of having the realities which transcend the mere things on this earth, that they be unveiled to us to see them with greater penetration. They are, for example, St. Catherine of Siena, famously back in the 1400s. She was educated to some degree, but she never had theological knowledge. But the woman also, from the age of five, had been having visions. She speaks about her first vision being towed by the hand of her sister going to Mass and seeing the Lord Jesus Christ over the front door of the parish church at five. And from there, she kept developing deeper and deeper through her adolescence, and in her 20s, now this is the woman who goes and tells the popes, move out of Avignon and move back to Rome where you're supposed to be. And if you do not go back, there will be repercussions. She's, what, 28 when she tells the popes to do this. And one, she says that he moves to Rome, it's an absolute chaos. So he wants to move back and she says, no, no, no. If you move back, you will be dead within six months. And he thought, what's this 28-year-old got to tell me what to do? So he moved back to Avignon, and he was dead within six months. So during this whole influence of Catherine of Siena, she was, she was often interrogated. She was questioned by the priest in that. And her ability to answer profound theological questions just mystified everyone. She had that knowledge of the spirit of revelation. In fact, you can buy the dialogues of St. Catherine of Siena. In recent decades, the Vatican has declared her as one of the doctors of the church. So profound is her knowledge. And yet it's a woman who had a basic education, but never studied philosophy or theology, but the spirit, the unveiling of revelation gave her a penetration into these mysteries 
that surround us in reality. God, Christ, these realities are always with us. Whether we're sitting in the pew, whether we're driving our car, whether we're in the middle of a fight in the kitchen, God is always present at every moment. And so that spirit of revelation is this entrance deeper and deeper into the knowledge of perception, not just simply to believe something, that we accept that it's taught, but to actually have, we would say to some degree, an understanding of what these realities are. So that what St. Paul is, and I want you to note in this epistle the number of times he refers to glory. Glory in itself is a rendering of praise, usually in our common way of speaking. But glory is something more profound in the Old Testament. When St. Paul speaks here, he says, not only the spirit of wisdom and of knowledge, but I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened. The heart is this, the center of your being. It's the original meaning of this, the Sacred Heart devotions in the Latin Church. It's not about anatomy. It's about person. It's about the individual. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is Jesus. Right? And so when we use this term of heart, and especially in the Old Testament, it means the very core of what makes a person. So the image that you know of the Sacred Heart, of our Lord revealing this heart that is crowned with thorns and has a cross, cross plunged into the top of it and flames, it's all symbolic of what is the inner reality of the world incarnate. So when St. Paul is saying this, he says, I'm asking that the very perception of the ability of the inner reality of who you are as individual persons be enlightened, be illuminated by the grace of God in this spirit of wisdom and revelation. It's a very beautiful idea, and it is the goal of all of our lives. So that when we speak about hope, excuse me, speak about the, the, the glory, St. Paul is linking it here to this enlightenment that we perceive in revelation, this knowledge, and also the wisdom, but also the establishment of hope that we are anchored into the ability not only to see our goal, but also to have the stability to per perceive it and to perseveringly follow after it. It's why you have in the hymn at the beginning of this liturgy and in the prayer of the Rusoyo, the reference is, please allow us to attain to the place that you've prepared for us. It's not guaranteed at this point. St. Paul's letter to the Philippians says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because it's not guaranteed just by being baptism. That begins the whole process. And so that's why St. Paul is asking, and so the next following verse, he says that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that you've been called out of just simply the human race, the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints. So he's referred to the Father of glory. He's reserved to the, the glory of the inheritance which is promised to the consecrated ones. That's what the saints means. Those who have been consecrated. You've been promised an inheritance. Earlier in chapter 1, he talks about the fact of this down payment that we receive from the Spirit. It's like the old days of layaway, right? You go to Montgomery Ward, you really want to get that refrigerator, but you don't have the money on hand before we all live by plastic carts. Now you first, you make your original down payments on it, and they hold it for you, right? But if at some point you didn't make the payments and you wandered away, you didn't get the fridge and you didn't get your money back. Montgomery Ward didn't care because they just got extra money. So when St. Paul uses this term of down payment, ares, in the text, He's saying that you've been given the Spirit of God for this revelation and this wisdom. It is pointing you in a direction. Don't fail in the following payments. Remain faithful to this and arrive at this inheritance of the glory. Now in the Old Testament, the glory of God, the Hebrew term itself refers to deference and weight. It has a very large sense to the original word. So the glory is the idea of the majesty by which God reveals himself and makes himself present. In the Old Testament, in the Exodus, the glory of God, the Shekinah. The Shekinah was that pillar of fire over the, over the Ark of the Covenant 
That when it was time for the people to move, it would rise up, they'd see it all up in the air, and they'd knock down their tents, and they'd be ready to go wherever it's going to lead them next. But it always remained over the place where the ark was held in what is known as the tent of meeting. And at night, this cloud was luminous. And this went on for decades. <coughs> when it came time, hundreds of years later, when Solomon built the temple, as they were consecrating the temple, this cloud appeared now within this building, to the point where, during the ceremonies, the priests all had to leave, because they couldn't see anything else in the building. This is the Shekinah, the presence but it's manifested by an external creature, this cloud that everyone can see. And what you wind up seeing is that then, by the prophecies of Ezekiel, hundreds of years after that episode, he sees the vision of the temple in which the Shekinah of the cloud, the glory of the Lord, leaves the temple and goes to the people who are now in exile in Babylon, south of Nineveh. And so now you've gone from the external manifestation on top of Mount Sinai to the location among in the center of the people, leading them during the Exodus, to the place of the temple itself in Jerusalem, and then in the destruction of the temple, this glory of God leaves in Ezekiel's vision and goes into exile with the people. No longer the tent, no longer the ark, no longer the building of the temple, but with the people themselves. And then in that same period, in the last 600 years of revelation taking place before the coming of our Lord, we're pushed towards a greater understanding of the manifestation of God's glory. Till we come to the revelation of the glory which takes place in the Incarnation in which the Word of God itself, God Himself, enters into our time through the incarnation and the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem. And the glory of the Lord at that point is now personally present of the divinity of our Lord. And that is why in the terms that St. Paul, St. John used at the beginning of his Gospel, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We talked about that on Wednesdays. He pitched His tent among us. The dwelling of God Himself is this person, Jesus Christ. And Christ, embracing death on Calvary, shatters that humanity in crucifixion. And in the resurrection and ascension, allows us by baptism to be consecrated into the same life of His glory at the right hand of His Father. When we talk about heaven, and we usually talk about it so glibly, Everybody dies and just goes to whatever this thing is called heaven. You just die and go there because you're dead. It's absurd. In Christianity, heaven is the entrance into the Lord Jesus Christ to be present within Him. It is an existential transformation. It's not just simply an eternal place in the Bahamas where you just have, you know, this is like your eternal timeshare. You can just stay there for good. This is absurd. Our Lord makes it clear, which is why this gospel was chosen from the Last Supper. There's no connection with the Ascension, not directly. But he says to them, as I've told the Jews before, where I'm going, you cannot come. Why? Because this is the glory of God who is speaking himself personally, God himself. What I am, you have no access to. Where I am going, you cannot come. And so now I say it also to you, the disciples who are sitting there at the Last Supper, but I go to prepare a place for you. And what is that going? That going is that rending and tearing of his flesh on Calvary, the death that he embraces freely, so that the access to that divine glory will be found in the resurrection and the ascension and at the glorification of the right hand of His Father. But I go to prepare you a place because it is this going through death and resurrection that you will now have access. And so when we begin by a baptism, the big bit baptism initiates the individual into this discipleship of following God. And our Lord says earlier in the Gospels also, that where I am, my disciple, the one who is learning from me, shall be with me. This is 
the notion of heaven. To be with and in Christ. Read the prayers of the Husoyu again. We talk about coming to the Father. Our Lord said very clearly in the Gospel, no one can come to the Father except by me. The hidden divinity always remains hidden. You only have access through the incarnate Word. This is heaven. This is the existential transformation that takes place when you baptize someone, when you baptize a baby, when an adult enters the church through baptism. That initiates now the entrance. We receive the down payment of God's pledge to us to bring us to that place, which is why the hymn at the beginning of the Mass and in the hymn, the Kolo, during the Husoyo, it says, please allow us to come to the place that you've prepared for us. Those places are there. They have names on them. But we, by free collaboration with grace and revelation, must arrive there, coordinated with this grace and collaborated with this gift. God has given us an invitation. Whether we respond to the invitation is another question. So, of course, as they say, I'm preaching to the choir, literally. <laughs> There's a lot of you this week. This is great. Last week, I think there were three valiant souls, but they sounded really good. Because, of course, you're in these pews. And by being present before the divine and forgiving altar of the Lord, you show that in your lives this invitation means something. Because you're here. You're not sleeping yet. You're not washing the kitchen floor. You're not shopping. You're here. And by the fact of bringing your bodies here, by being present in this divine mystery, we say in that action, Lord God, I desire this glory. I desire that you give me the spirit of revelation and of wisdom, that I see ever more deeply in my lives what is the glory of God. And there is glory. There's even glory in washing the kitchen floor, but not on Sunday morning. God is found everywhere when we have the eyes to see. So that's what I meant by preaching to the choir. You're here, and God bless you for being here before the Lord God. But understand that what is promised to us is so much deeper and so much more beautiful. This word glory, we use it all the time. When we use the anaphora today of St. John Chrysostom, I just call your attention to the number of times John Chrysostom has used the word doxa in the Greek. Glory. Shbucho in the Aramaic. Praise, it also means praise. Because it's a promise given to us, the strength and the power, which is why in this vision of St. Paul, and read both of these chapters of the Ephesians, what is the exaltation of the right hand of God the Father is that our Lord God is assimilating to himself all things under his power and majesty at the right hand of the Father. And all things are brought to him because of that primacy of being the head. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about the recapitulation of all things in God. Maybe not, we'll even go back, it's still online. So, this whole recapitulation, this primacy of Christ over all of creation <coughs> through his glorification <coughs> is why he is head of the church. The church is one aspect and the avant-garde, the transformation of all of creation in glory. You have been invited to be part of that transformation that all the trees and bunny rabbits are going to follow someday on the last day of judgment. But you do it consciously when with an awareness and a promise of personal intimacy that we call heaven. That we call this presence which is promised to us if we only respond to become disciples. That's why the end of the quotation that we have today is making reference <coughs> to the fact of him being the one who fills all in all and who is also the head of all of that assembly of the consecrated, the assembly of the saints, those who have heard the voice of God and through water and baptism, through water and the Spirit, have been transformed. So that what was accomplished in Christ, personally, in his glorification, is given to us in Christ and being initiated in Christ which is why you have in verse 20. 
that which he accomplished in Christ, raising him up from the dead and setting him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So in this exaltation, we are promised an existential transformation, which is not just for the moment that we die, but which is meant to begin now, here below. And hence, this spirit of wisdom and of revelation. So may St. Isaac of Nineveh, <coughs> our Katari, <coughs> may he intercede for us, to obtain for us not only a deepening of, but the desire also for the spirit of revelation and this knowledge within the Lord God. Because as our Lord, as St. Paul finishes the last verse you have, he has made him head over all, the church, which is his body, and the fullness of him, of the one who fills all in all. We could be promised nothing more beautiful and nothing more profound. All we have to do is listen, hear, and follow faithfully. And the one who perseveres to the end shall be saved. That's heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
we accept these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As you remember our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God and permitted to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph Christos, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Chardel, and the four evangelists. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the intentions of Subdeep and Michael Shani. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you are adored by all angels, bless you, humanity, exalt you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children, call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We give them unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly, it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our faith. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming. Remember 
my death until I come again. justice and holiness 
May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them, to lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your Son, glorious St. Stephen the Archdeacon and First Martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. All the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints. And in your mercy forgive our sins and their grant us, O God, to the departed and forgive the sins we have Deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will. That in all us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was in the shall be forever.
O Lord, our Lord, you sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity, and he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, <coughs> as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And be with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty, and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, one, one Holy Son, one, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for a new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies, and your blood with our souls, in the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the holy cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So you'll note that the Mass has been offered today for Subdeacon Michael Shami. None of you know him, that's why I'm telling you now. He's ordained this morning in Rome to the diaconate. The next year, God willing, he'll be a priest for the Western Eparchy, though he's originally from New Jersey. Though I told him, I said we'd all pray for him as he enters into this diaconate and pray for many vocations. We need the vocations for the priesthood. May God bless them all for their generosity. <coughs> Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <laughs>